you know, in, in response to the, the first question as well, um, you know, religion uh, is less of a motivating factor for each generation that goes by, and, and, and in some ways, luckily so, becoming uh, more rational. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, I, I think it is very important to understand some of the historical reasons for prohibition. A lot of people think that it was made illegal because of hemp and the reaper madness era, and certainly, you know, the recent wave of prohibition is a result of this military industrial complex eliminating hemp first and foremost. And, and, but the history of prohibition goes back much deeper than that. And having an understanding of why and how it was prohibited gives you some very good tools when you run across these religious folk uh, I myself, having been raised in the United Church and you know, knowing some of uh, its doctrines, uh, have been able to have conversations that really open their eyes up to what their own Bible and teachings are. And it can be uh, really empowering. It's really neat to see how many like people are out there doing things like bomb hits for Jesus up in Alaska and stuff. Like, you know, it's really kind of neat the awareness that's coming, and a lot of Christians are embracing cannabis and Christ, and the more. Uh, that these sorts of ideas are, are spread and, and, and uh, you know, shared amongst our community, the less fear there will be uh, of this plant and its history. And uh, so I, I have found Chris's teachings to be invaluable for myself. And uh, you know, while it might not be something you want to get into a lot, uh, you know, for me, uh, if we want to you know, know where to go, we have to know how we got here. So I wanted to ask a question in Chris in regards to where on okay, where wait, Chris, yeah. there's, there's a question coming to oh, you. Yeah. Where on the timeline uh, with your challenge or your court challenge on the religious aspect around cannabis, where are you at with that and all that? Are you in the Supreme Court now? Is there yeah, I mean, I'm in federal now? court. I'm in federal court. Basically, what we did is uh, we wrote Health Canada, me and a lawyer, Kirk Tussaw, yes. and we requested a religious uh, exemption based on Exemption 56, which was medi what medical marijuana was granted with before the MMAR. For the people or for the individual? For the individual. An Exemption 56 for an individual. This was rejected, and then that opens it up to a federal court challenge. Uh, of of uh, the decision, and then all the charter issues of, uh, of of cannabis and religion can be there. I brought affidavits from three professors: a professor of anthropology, a professor of mythology, and a professor of psychology, going over the history history of cannabis, and then entered that as evidence. And then we had a number of uh, depositions, and now we're just heading towards final arguments. But Canada has granted tentatively uh, an exemption 56 for the use of ayahuasca. Uh, a very powerful DMT containing beverage used by a South American group, the Santa Dime. And a similar group in uh, the United States has been granted an exemption for ayahuasca there, as well as there's been peyote exemptions granted in America for religious purposes. Okay. Now, will that be just for you as an individual? It would be for me as an individual, but it would open it up to, you know, like the medical marijuana exemption started with an individual right. in court, you know, similar type of process. And then that would uh, follow through with other people, you know, being able to approach it and that type of thing. Yeah, you bet. Do you want to make a comment on the uh, Canadian Coalition of Churches coming out against S10 this week? Yeah, I think that's great. You know, uh, um, there's some compassion out there for de definitely. You know, I was kind of slagging religion there, but um, uh, definitely there's you know some compassion in some of these places, and uh, uh, many churches have come out in favor of medical marijuana in the United States as well. Excellent question, though. Uh, I, I should have. Reminded Chris to speak out about that a bit here, but yeah, best of luck in your court challenge. And again, thank you so much for everything over the years, Chris. So, uh, as I said, Hempology 101 uh, does a lot of various things. Um, I love to promote hemp, and uh, you see me here. I've got some uh, hemp insulation from Nepal, actually, and uh, I think somewhere around here is my uh, hemp. Uh, sandwich board. They're making plywood basically uh, in China. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we're not making it here. But uh, I also brought some hemp paper that my friend Kristen made. If you grab one of our newspapers in the back, uh, one of the things that Hempology is now doing is we publish a newspaper, the Cannabis Digest. We've just got four issues out in print now. It's free. I brought a lot of them. If you're from out of town or from somewhere else, please take more to distribute. I don't really have a great distribution network set up. It's a, a free paper. It's still costing us lots of money to publish, but 
it's a really uh, powerful tool to inform people about how to make hemp paper. And uh, this paper here is, uh, is made out of actually pot stock. It's uh, Mountain Mint, something that we sell at the Buyers Club and we made paper. And so you uh, can read about that in, in the newspaper. And we also, uh, in the newspaper, educate people as much as we can about Bill S-10, which will get mentioned throughout the day. In fact, we have some little flyers at the back. Uh, for a while now, we've sort of had an ongoing phone jam uh, against various people in government. Now we're focused on Michael Ignatia, the leader of the Liberal Party, who at least has said that they're interested in, in possibly going to help fight S10 and some of the other crime agenda. And what we're asking the Liberals to do is to study the costs of, the operating costs of Bill S10. They put aside $9 billion for building 22 prisons right now in Canada for people like me, and uh, they don't know what it's going to cost to, and us, I should say, uh, they don't know what's going to cost to operate these. It's a provincial responsibility, so they haven't studied it, they haven't included it in any of their information. In fact, they don't even know what it's going to cost. They don't really care. They just want to build prisons and throw us all away because God told them to. Anyway, uh, we're really, uh, we got a 1 800 number, it's 1 800 Old Canada, and uh, we have the handouts, we have information in our newspaper about that as well. So uh, please try and do everything we can to, to help us fight us. Uh, one thing that we do uh, is uh, every Friday, we in Victoria from noon to 1, and they, my friends did it this morning, stand uh, down at the Inner Harbor uh, giving out the old S10 flyers. We stand with Jobs Not Jails signs and uh, a couple of other signs. and we, It's sort of almost like using some Jehovah Witness tactics against them, where we just stand on the corner and just quietly solicit. It's kind of like Greenpeace, but instead of asking for money, we just want people to stand up for themselves. Just learn a little bit. Here, make a phone call. Just do something to help fight these laws and the ignorance behind it. And so it's been very good for us to be just standing there with some newspapers and handouts and smiling and waving. And we not only do it every Friday for one hour, but we also Saturdays move from one location to another. And in fact, next week, we're going to be here at the Heritage Hall on Main Street. Um, somewhere in my newspaper at the back, you'll find an advertisement for the Canamed Fair. Uh, hopefully, Sita will be here at the end. She's the main person behind this. But next week, uh, we have the first ever cannabis uh, trade fair happening here in, in Vancouver. We're kind of piggybacking the two groups off of each other. And there's a lot of businesses with booths and stuff that are going to be there, and a few speakers as well. In fact, uh, next Saturday, I don't know exactly when, but I'm going to be playing my game show, Reach for the Pot. Uh, I actually have the world's only cannabis game show. It's a lot of fun to play. I need eight contestants, so if you're there next week, first eight people that get to me get in, in the game. I have two teams of four. We have a lot of trivia and, and contests, and everybody gets prizes, but it's a heck of a lot of fun. And so we'll be playing the game show next week at the trade fair, and a whole bunch of other people are coming for that. So uh, again, uh, the information's in our newspaper, the Canvas Digest. A few logistics for today before I let our next speaker come up here. Uh, um, we uh, have a few costs uh, associated with this and uh, other conventions. And the way we get our money back, if, if we get it back at all, is we have a raffle. So there's a beautiful little uh, glass bong back there, some art and uh, other stuff, kind of my back table uh, by, by the stand there. And uh, two bucks a ticket, three bucks uh, gets you five tickets. Is that it? No. No, oh, five bucks gets you three tickets. I really like that. Yeah, five bucks gets you three tickets. We'll do the raffle right at four here at the end, so there's lots of time to come uh, and, and grab some at the back. But uh, by all means, there's lots of stuff to give away. And I have a bunch of stuff for sale there, too. I got Team 420 t-shirts. It's organic hemp and cotton, $25. We have the cultivation game for sale here as well. It's $15 for a cultivation game. Um, it's a long story, but I ended up with a, a game op last year. My bake op got busted. <laughs> so we've got a couple hundred board games we're trying to sell and get our money back. Um, and uh, a few other things back there as well. So please come back and chat with me if you have a chance here. Um, I guess uh, the next time I get up, I'll talk more about the Cannabis Buyers Club. But 15 years ago, right now, I started the first medical dispensary well, in Canada. Now it turns out to be the oldest in the world. Uh, it's run in Victoria. I have 3,400 sick people in my care. And uh, the last speaker today, John Conroy, is the lawyer uh, with uh, Kirk Tussaud in our legal defense fund because our bakery actually got raided last year. We have 29 food and skin products uh, that we make. And 
I'll get into some of that. And with John, more questions about the MMAR as well. He's uh, certainly a lead expert in that field. So we'll touch on some medical issues and things there. But uh, our next speaker has traveled uh, all the way up from Seattle here, again, uh, taking a day off practicing law to come and help uh, inspire and, and teach and, and network with us up here. Uh, we've been very fortunate with Hempology the last few years. We've had a member from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition at almost every single one of our events. Next month, we have a professor, a criminology prof from VIU coming to speak. Uh, February 20th is the UVic convention. And then uh, March 20th, the VI convention, VIU convention, sorry, uh, Tony Smith from uh, on the mainland here, a former RCMP officer, will be speaking. So we have different LEAP speakers at each of our events. And we're not even using our sort of uh, top star in the field. We have a police officer, David Bratzer, who's an active uh, officer over in Victoria, who's a member of LEAP as well. And I'm pretty sure we'll have him here next year. Uh, we couldn't bring him this year because he's actually the exhibits officer in our bakery trial. It's a small town over there. <laughs> anyway, our next speaker again, Jim, is part of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And it's the group, come on up here, Jim, uh, has made a, a wonderful difference. Thank you so much for your efforts and coming up here. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure he'll be scaring and inspiring us at the same time. But thank you so very much, Jim. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to come up here. Um, I am representing LEAP as an organization, a law enforcement against prohibition. Most of the members of LEAP are people who have spent time wearing a badge in the trenches, uh, doing undercover work and police work. Um, I sort of came to it um, and, um, and I'm a member because uh, I worked as a prosecutor and a defense attorney. Uh, but before going to law school, um, I also worked as a corrections officer. Um, so I've been a part of the legal system in the United States for many years. Uh, I've been a practicing lawyer for over 30 years. Um, and some of it has involved um, marijuana and, uh, and drug issues. Um, I haven't been directly doing drug work um, uh, as part of my practice for a number of years, but what happened, um, it was about eight years ago in Seattle, uh, the president of the Bar Association down there put a letter in the monthly newsletter that goes out to all of the attorneys in Seattle, and he said, you know, we really need to do something about the drug war in the United States and the policies and what it's doing to our court system, to our legal system, and to our society. He said, if you're interested, please contact me. Well, there was a huge outpouring of support from the attorneys down there um, who said, yeah, we want to get involved. Because at this point, the drug war in the United States has affected almost every family in one way or another. Um, sometimes it's from somebody being arrested. Um, it's from people having problems with drugs um, because of impurities in drugs. Uh, people have known people who have overdosed. So if you look around and talk to families, everybody's been impacted in one way or another. Um, so the Bar Association got involved uh, and started saying, we need to really look at this issue. They started a drug policy project down there. And they invited, as one of the speakers, Jack Cole, who was one of the founders of the LEAP organization. And so I heard Jack speak. Um, and it just made such amazing sense to me that I thought, I've got to get involved. Um, I've been watching the system grind people up and churn people up for years. Um, and uh, I want to do what I can to bring about some change. And that was about seven or eight years ago. And I've been a speaker with LEAP and a speaker with the Bar Association for that time. And I was reconciled to the fact that it was going to be a slow process, bringing about social change on this issue. And it's been amazing what's happened over the last two years, uh, two or three years, in the United States and in Canada and other places. Um, all of a sudden, people are paying attention. I don't know why people didn't years ago. Um, through the 1980s and 1990s, um, this was a sleeper issue that people really weren't paying attention to. 
Um, the system was just grinding people up. So um, I'm real encouraged by what's going on. The fact that there are meetings like this, that we have Hempfest in Seattle, um, that people are starting to talk about the issues. Um, the wonderful advantage of the LEAP organization is that um, because we're establishment sort of group, group uh, people that have worked directly as officers or lawyers or prosecutors, um, we've been able to go in and talk to the local uh, community groups, the Kiwanis group, the Lions group, the Rotary group, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, lots of civic organizations. And we've had an amazingly positive response. Because by the time you sit down and, and help people connect the dots of what's going on with, I think it's $81 billion a year was being spent. And this is a combination of the money that's spent directly for um, helping to support the police um, process, for the process of arresting, prosecuting, and defending people in court, for incarcerating people, uh, the impacts on the society. It's a huge expense. And now there are, of course, many, many reasons to be against the, the war on drugs and to seek change in our drug policies. Um, but one argument that all of a sudden is making a lot of sense in the United States um, is that it's a waste of money. You know, the economic argument. Um, we talk to business people. Um, and they realize that tax dollars are uh, getting scarcer and scarcer. As our economy has been hurting, um, we have limited resources. And those tax money needs to be spent on things that are essential. Education, health care, um, helping people with disabilities. We have huge needs of taxpayer money and certainly shouldn't be going to a policy that doesn't work, that hurts our society. Uh, so the impacts uh, have been huge, and all of a sudden the economic argument is resonating with a lot of people. Um, about, let's see, one, two, three, four years ago, I went to the uh, biannual drug policy, um, what's it called? Drug policy conference, every two years in the United States. And it was fascinating to be there. Um, there were a lot of the LEAP uh, representatives were there. but. It was fascinating that there were, I think, 30, 40 different organizations there sharing ideas. And you could see how people are coming at it from lots of different directions. There are people that are concerned um, about the corrections movement and a huge number of people that are incarcerated. Um, and uh, there's a whole organization about that. There are people uh, working on uh, harm reduction. You know, they're interested in being able to provide free needles to, uh, to drug users. Um, there are people that, that come at this issue from lots of different directions. Um, and it's all supportive. Um, people in our organization, we don't take a position for or against marijuana, for or against any drugs. What we're basically saying is that um, prohibition as a model doesn't work. You know, in the United States, you know your history, uh, we tried alcohol prohibition in 1929 um, and uh, 19, I'm sorry, 1919. Um, it obviously didn't work. What happened when you prohibit a substance that people want is you create a black market. When you create the black market, you give over all control um, to an unregulated market that will supply as much product as possible often without considerations for the purity of the product. And they sell to anybody that will, that will buy. Um, and so that happened with alcohol in the United States in 1929, 1919. Uh, and what happened was the, what was called the Roaring Twenties. It, it became a wild time because um, there was a great financial incentive for the criminal element to produce and import and sell as much alcohol as possible. Um, and we had rising crime in the United States because of turf wars between the various gangs. That's the time when Al Capone and uh, his group
came to prominence in Chicago, different groups in different places. Um, that's when the old Tommy guns came out. If you, the old early assault weapons. Uh, if you know your history or watch the old movies. Um, and basically the streets became lawless and the murder rate went up um, and uh, the government uh, lost tax revenue because all of a sudden liquor was illegal so they couldn't collect tax on it. Um, and everything <coughs> went to hell until they repealed prohibition and realized that uh, that they needed to regulate the alcohol market because people were going to drink it. And so they had to buy it somewhere. And so they moved from a black market to a regulated market. And certainly there are lots of problems with alcohol um, and still creates lots of problems. Um, but we realized that socially, when you prohibit something, it doesn't do away with the problem. It just drives it into an underground market that has its own particular problems. And uh, I think a lot of what has gathered the attention of people in recent years uh, is the explosion of violence in Mexico. More people have died in the last five years in Mexico than have died in the war in Afghan Afghanistan. You know, the deaths in Mexico are just unbelievable. 20, 30, 40 a week, 50 a week. Um, people are being beheaded, stuck in acid. Um, the gangs are just running them up. And it's turf wars between rival gangs that are trying to control a very, very lucrative market. Um, so it's the demand for drugs in the United States that is tearing apart uh, Mexican society. I mean, their tourism industry is down. Uh, the people are suffering. Some of the towns are near the border are getting to be ghost towns. It's just not safe to even be there. Um, and this is all because of the black market caused by prohibiting drugs. So um, some of the groups a number of years ago were saying, well, we need to legalize marijuana. Uh, the LEAP organization says, that the same argument holds true for all illegal drugs. You know, whether it's marijuana, heroin, any drug. Um, we have huge problems with um, heroin, partly because of impurities. Um, people don't know the, the, the percentage or the strength of heroin before they use it. Um, heroin overdoses have gone up. The strength of heroin on the streets has gone up. Um, I think it used to be 5 or 10% pure 30 years ago. Uh, and now some of the stuff uh, I hear in the streets of Vancouver is up to 80 or 90% pure. I'm not a whiz on these figures, but um, remarkably strong drug. Um, and people, you know, people are selling some of the drugs on the street are in it to make money. And they cut it with impurities. Um, and that's a reason for some overdoses. Uh, if someone has an addiction, they need their drug, and they're going to use it. Um, and uh, if it's an impure drug, they're going to put it into their body, um, and that shouldn't have to happen. If someone has an addiction, they've got a medical problem. Um, they need their drug. Uh, it should be provided in a, a pure dose and counseling given so someone can deal with their addiction problem. So. We have a whole range of issues, um, and certainly changing and going to a regulated market uh, is the way to go. We think that the uh, Proposition 19 in California was a wake-up call for a lot of the country in realizing that um, we're not that far from making change. In the United States, it's going to be a struggle. And people weren't sure if Proposition 19 <coughs> passed, uh, what was going to happen uh, with the federal government response. The one thing we do know is that um, lawyers would be in there making money because there was going to be a big battle in court. Um, and in the United States, we have a, we have a constant tussle between uh, states' rights and federal rights, and uh, in what areas states have the right to make their own decisions. And the federal government has tolerated medical marijuana uh, in the United States uh, to some extent. Uh, there's been certainly been skirmishes along the way, but the federal government hasn't taken direct action to try to nullify uh, 
and use the argument of preemption to uh, roll back the state laws on medical marijuana. But it's going to take a while, and it's going to be a process, and who ever thought it would take this long? Uh, you know, I went through college in the late 60s, um, and um, of course back then as a student, I thought you know, the revolution was around the corner, we were about to go through a huge social change, and we were going through a lot of change at the time uh, with um, the rights for minorities, with the rights for women, um, but the political process moves slowly. Um, we learned that in social activist causes back then. Um, but I never expected it to take this long. For my role in the, in the legal system, in our criminal system, I always thought that, well, it's not part of the laws that I think make a lot of sense, but I figured I would do my part, whatever it was within the system, and eventually things would change. But I've been waiting for a long, long time, and it, it's nice to be part of the social change movement, to hustle the process along. Um, and I, I'm not a whiz on your laws here in Canada, um, although I certainly read some things about mandatory minimum sentences coming in. I think this is sort of a rear guard action, part of the fear that goes on in our societies as, as we're going through a shift um, in perspective. You know, we have a lot of liberal thinking people, um, but the conservative people feel very, very threatened by cannabis and by social change. Um, and it's just going to take some time. Um, and it's up to you to do what you can uh, to work for that change to support it um, and to be reasonable in um, how you explain the issue to people. Uh, there are a lot of conservative people who um, don't realize that cannabis is just a way to get high, just like you can drink beer or wine. You know, um, If you want to get high one way or the other, it shouldn't become a criminal issue. Um, drugs can certainly be uh, a social issue. It could be a medical issue for people if they become addicted to um, hard drugs. Uh, it can certainly cause problems with people's lives. Um, but if someone is not harming someone else, they're harming themselves, it shouldn't be a criminal issue. Uh, we should work with people to help them out. Uh, but we certainly shouldn't throw people in jail and ruin their lives. Here, here. My first involvement with the negative side of the, the war on drugs was back in it was 1969. Um, I was in college. I was at a small college in the eastern United States, a Jesuit college. Um, and I was a resident assistant. Do you still use the term RA? Yes. And, yeah. I was a resident assistant, and all of a sudden cops were running down the hall one night, and they took away two guys that were three doors down the hall from me, and we never saw them again. That was it. Um, they were thrown in jail. You know, they had been selling some drugs, and um, and we were all amazed um, at that. And and uh, I don't know what happened to their lives, but I certainly know that countless numbers of people have had their lives screwed up in a thousand different ways because of making this a criminal issue. Um, drugs are a social issue. It's a matter of personal choice. It can be a serious medical issue, um, but it shouldn't be a criminal issue. And that's the basic <coughs> message that LEAP has been taking out to communities across America. You know, we have representatives throughout the United States. Um, we have a number of bar associations now in the United States that are picking up the cause. Um, we have a large number of people just taking the message out. And it used to be strange. Um, it, it used to be an odd message to talk about legalization of all drugs. Um, but all of a sudden, it's not unusual to hear that now. And, and I don't know if you've watched YouTube. Did, did it, how many of you saw uh, President Obama addressing the issue of drug legal, legalization? A few of you? I've, I've got the link on my, on my smartphone here, if you want to watch it. But what happened was YouTube sponsored 
um, a thing where you could uh, take questions that you wanted the President Obama to answer. Um, and he did this as part of like a, a question and answer session. And um, the one question that got the most votes that people wanted Obama to answer was about um, drug legalization. And it was posed by a member of, of the LEAP organization. Um, and certainly we didn't get as great a response as we would have wanted. Um, but President Obama admitted that um, drug legalization is an issue and something that needs to be discussed. He said he's not in favor of it, um, but he acknowledged that we need to reallocate resources, that we're not putting resources to treatment centers that are needed for people that have problems with drugs. Um, certainly I know in Canada and the United States, uh, we have huge expenditures on prisons, partly because of uh, people being incarcerated for drugs. Um, and that's something that is a problem for our, our society, just the, the expense of that, uh, the needless expense for people incarcerated for drugs. Now, I'm with an organization of law enforcement people. We clearly take the position that if someone commits a crime while under the influence of drugs, they should be prosecuted like anybody else, like someone that commits a crime when they're, when they're drunk. You run over somebody with your car when you're drunk, um, you know, uh, alcohol is no defense. It should be the same with drugs. You know, people get wild on meth and, and uh, freak out and, and hurt somebody, they should be incarcerated. Uh, but to the extent that a lot of people are arrested for possession uh, or for uh, when they're not harming anybody, then certainly they shouldn't be subject to arrest or incarceration. So we'd much rather see the funds put for rehabilitation. When um, my earliest job on drug issues was back in 1972, I worked for uh, a lawyer's assistant at a public defender office getting people into drug and alcohol treatment programs. And at the time, I never had a, had, I never was unable to get someone into a treatment program within two weeks. And this was back in 1972. Now we have less resources available. It's hard. Some people have to wait three, four, five months to get a bed opening in a drug treatment center because the money's going to locking people up instead of helping them with their problems. Um, so we've gone backwards. And we need to reallocate our resources and just put our heads on straight and realize that people that use drugs recreationally, if they're not hurting anybody, that's fine. If people do have a problem with drugs uh, and they develop an addiction problem, they need medical help. Um, if people have problems with drugs and it's causing problems with their employment, their relationships, they need counseling. Um, so. Uh, our concern is all drugs, not just marijuana. Heroin, meth, ecstasy, whatever the drug is, they've all got their pluses and minuses, uh, but it shouldn't be a legal issue. And I'm going to be here for the whole session. After I speak, you can ask questions in the back, but um, Ted, I, I got time to take some questions now? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Great. So, yeah, I was wondering uh, why don't the, the establishment? take the money out of the drugs and have manufacturers, say in the United States, and turn the whole drug thing into a medical thing, right? And you guys would stop crying like that. I want to know why that doesn't happen. Well, you know, it's, it's an issue of politics. For instance, in, there's a bill that was introduced last year in the Washington State Legislature to legalize marijuana uh, to establish a process of distribution through the state liquor stores, mm -hmm. to establish licenses for people to grow it, and so that the quality would be maintained, there would be a distribution system, and it would be taxed. So instead of losing money on the whole drug issue through the huge amounts of money um, on, on law enforcement, it would be in spent, instead be a money maker. And I think that was obviously an issue in California. Um, 
that they realized that they couldn't make money. Now, some people who grow marijuana are not real hot about the idea of going to a, a regulated market. You know, the big companies are going to move in there. It's going to become a big industry. It's not going to be Jack and Joe, you know, in their garage growing marijuana. I think largely it's going to grow into being a, a big industry. Um, it's going to have its pluses and minuses. Um, but I'm in favor of that if it means we're not arresting people. Uh, we're collecting taxpayer money and using it to help people <coughs> rather than hurt people. So, question. Uh, <coughs> my employer, BC Maritime Employers Association, the waterfront, they stole democracy through the Canadian Human Rights Advocate newspaper that runs coast to coast. Um, the last article, 1989, September. Now, whoever rules the waterfront rules the world. They are the ones that's, that's not letting okay. the legalization of marijuana. Steve Harper's Canada, it should be the people's Canada. Yeah, now, I, I, I realize you're upset, issue. sir, but this issue has nothing to do with cannabis, really. So we're going to stick with the cannabis-related issues. There's lots of people that want to talk about that. So I see four uh, hands. So one, two, three, four, five. And then we're probably going to take those questions as quick as we can. And as Jim said, he's going to stay here for the event. So if you have more specific questions, but I think you were first on that. Yeah. Right? I'd like to know where Link was when Mark Emery went to jail. Where was that legal defense? Um, LEAP does not provide legal defense for people. Uh, we're out there discussing the issues. We're primarily uh, an organization trying to educate people about the issues and to bring about policy change. And, you know, we collect money like every other organization. Um, and there may be a few of us that are lawyers, but personally, for the last 18 years, I haven't been doing court work. Um, so we aren't a legal defense fund. Well, shouldn't we get that together to do that work? No. Well, that's more the BC civil liberty. That, if, if I can respond, Jim's not from here, but that would be more the, the responsibility of the BC Civil Liberties Association, which is a coalition of lawyers working on civil rights issues. Uh, LEAP uh, is not uh, mandated and, and focused upon you know individuals that, that are in court at this point. They're a, a much more uh, sort of global and, and idealistic uh, organization. Uh, yeah. It, 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 I, uh, yeah mostly say, police officers <coughs> as opposed yeah. to lawyers. Is that yeah. also true? And I, I would point out the American Civil Liberties Union um, has taken this on uh, drug, drug uh, policy reform as one of their major issues, and they do provide court assistance to people in the United States. Oh, they do. Okay. Yeah. Um, second question. So, no pun intended. But what kind of leaps forward have you guys made? What are what are you doing? Now? What are we doing now? Um, I think we took. I think probably uh, one of the boldest views and broadest views about drug moving to a regulated market. And we brought that issue to the front in the United States probably more effectively than some of the other groups. They've been around much longer. Um, normal has been around for years, um, but it, it was often difficult for a, a normal speaker to get in front of a lot of civic groups. And what we found is that the LEAP organization has been effective in getting the conversation going. If change is going to happen, it's going to be a political process. It's going to have to go through your parliament. It's going to have to go through our state legislatures. Yeah. To do that, you have to change people's perceptions and their ideas about drugs. People are scared about drug legalization. You know what they what they think of is that everybody's going to be running amok with drugs. You know, and and sometimes a very effective <coughs> argument I've used is you know with a, uh, a local Kiwanis group. I say, well, you know, if all drugs were regulated, you could go buy heroin. How many people here in the room are going to go buy some heroin? You know, <laughs> and very little, you know, the hands don't go up because they know that, hmm, you know, that's some dangerous stuff. I probably don't want to do that. They may go out and buy some marijuana, but they're not going to buy the heroin. Part of what people need to realize is that if you educate people, 
they'll make reasonable decisions. In the United States, and I think in Canada, we are here, made a huge strides in cutting back on the number of people that choose to smoke tobacco. You know, people are realizing and learning it's got some downsides to it. You know, we pass laws that make it a obnoxious for people to smoke. You can't smoke at work. You can't smoke in the restaurant. You can't smoke in the bar. You've got to be 20 feet from the doorway, out on the sidewalk. Um, and there have been some very effective ads. So I think that it's going to be a struggle when we move to a regulated market. I think there will be age restrictions, whether it's 18 or 19 or 21, for purchasing of drugs. Um, but there's going to have to be a lot of effort put into education so that people realize that drugs are not drugs, generically. You know, marijuana is marijuana. Heroin and meth are very, very different. Every drug has its characteristics, so we're going to have to, and that was one of the big problems with the DARE program. And you didn't have that up here in Canada. Oh, yeah. Did you? Oh, oh, yes. Still do. Oh, yeah. You know, that was the biggest problem. You know, it went in and said, all drugs are bad, you know. And then the kid in the eighth grade, seventh grade, he smokes his first joint and says, drugs aren't all bad, you know? So it was a disservice because people then thought, well, if, if marijuana wasn't bad, well, maybe heroin or meth would be okay too. Instead of really telling people, give them the straight skinny about what these drugs do, your, do to your body, which ones are addictive, which ones are gonna, um, you know, potentially put you over the edge. So um, education, is part of what LEAP does, and it's part of what we need to do in a big way. And if you wanted to find, I guess, the most pivotal moment, from my understanding, um, and I'm probably going to say it wrong, but uh, there is an association of police officers uh, in California. Um, uh, uh, say it wrong, but I think it may have even been like the black or colored yeah. police yeah. officers, <laughs> active officers, that actually supported Prop 19 and legalization of California and Canada. And uh, it, it's uh, been a, a slow move to have active police officers speaking about legalization. Uh, but I don't think there could be a more powerful representative of our ideals than actual, you know, badge-carrying officers and you know, lawyers and retired members of LEAP that their officers that got LEAP started have been able to, you know, uh, breach the the crest into active officers. And, and I would have to say that that's been their the biggest highlight today. If about five years ago, six years ago, the uh, National Association of Sheriffs held their annual convention in Seattle. And they had a big exhibit booth. You know, they were selling, you know, the plastic handcuffs and they had they had armored personnel carriers, they had all the people making the handcuffs of metal ones and, and the gun manufacturers. And we had a booth there. And and so we'd have people come by and they'd sort of look disinterested, they'd look at our literature. And, and a lot of them would say, I support you, I just can't come out and say that publicly. You know, good luck to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it was, it was interesting to be there in, in the midst of the law enforcement community um, and get that support. Um, no, it was, it's, it's John, right? Yeah. Been a while, buddy. Here, good question. I wrote on how to take a and I. I made the mistake of showing my writings of, uh, of cannabis and cannabis culture. My psychiatrist at St. Paul said, you gave me to help me that, I'll give you to help me with that. And he gives me this thing called cannabis psychosis, right? So I'm on a ward in St. Paul's hospital for eight months for cannabis psychosis. Only able to escape once in a while from friends. From there, I was planted at Adamac Park Lodge on 871 8th I don't know the exact one. Adamac is at Adamac Boundary. And uh, uh, they, they make it, one of the things about counter is you can't get it together and get your neck. You don't want to figure out. And, uh, I'm taking a big risk being away from that place. A greater risk going back. So um, I don't know what John. to say. Okay. That. Good luck with yeah, your I, I, I was going to say, John, I, I don't get the sense you really have a question, do you? Well, I, I just want I'm to glad to see you here. Watch out for the kind of yeah. they'll be there. If you have this psychosis. Fair enough. 
Yeah, I know you've been through a lot of struggles, John. I'm glad to see you here. It's been several years now. But I don't mean to, to be rude, but uh, there's a few more questions. But Question? What's happening? Yeah, uh, two palm comments. One was you were talking about the cost. Do you have any idea what just the pot cost the social system on the enforcement side and the incarceration side in Washington State? Is there any numbers? Um, I don't have that. And you know, if you go to the LEAP website, which is uh, leap.cc, um, we have a lot of figures for the national level. Um, I know it's probably... What's the national level? The national level, you know, I should know this off yeah. by heart. I think it was $81 billion. Just for pot alone? Well, no, that, that was for all drugs. Oh, yeah, all drugs. And it's hard to separate it because, you know, when a cop finds you with one or one or the other drug, it doesn't make much difference. You well, know? I have a good friend living in Portugal where they, I don't know, they decriminalized or what, but everything's available there, and apparently crime went down 90%. It's just unbelievable. Do you have any analysis yeah. from that point of view? Um, Portugal, I think, is, is one of the first, first country in Europe that has totally um, legalized drugs. Yeah. Um, they've had a pretty good... Um, he said very good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, they haven't had major problems. Mm -hmm. I think if you go to the web, you, you know, the web is such a wonderful place for information. If you type in Portugal and drug legalization, you probably come up with some information and some studies. Um, and, you know, there's change coming on in a lot of countries. There's some fascinating things. In Switzerland, by a vote, they approved giving, giving heroin to people that had documented addiction so that they could get their heroin. But then, um, by also a public vote, um, they decided to not legalize marijuana. So. Um, different cultures uh, and laws are going to happen. What I can say is that we're moving to change because the current prohibition model doesn't work. You know, it causes more problems. But we're going to see um, we're going to see pockets of change in different places. And Portugal is a wonderful example. Their society hasn't fallen apart, even though they legalized. But I see on the other side um, in Amsterdam. Um, they're maybe scaling back on the what they call the coffee shops where you can buy marijuana because they don't want people from other countries coming in to buy there it's for locals only. Um, we're in a time of transition, and we're going to see a lot of things pioneered. Um, it's it's going to be great to see um, how things shift. You know, certainly in the United States, we've got. I think 13 or 16 states now that have medical marijuana laws. Um, there are laws uh, pending in several other states. Um, gradually, people are getting more used to marijuana being around. You know, you can walk the streets in Seattle, the same as in Vancouver, and, and you can smell marijuana. Um, so far, society hasn't fallen apart there. Um, the cops are glad to not have to spend their time running around you know, arresting people and jacking up their statistics with marijuana arrests. Um, the change will come. Okay, so one last question then. Sorry, uh, oh, it was this gentleman here. Sorry, and there was a short list. Uh, Jim Wills, be around. Um, I forgot the question. Okay, well then you go, you're in. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so we all know that if you market, maybe next year, For me, I know I can go into Vancouver and personally buy seeds without a medical license, but would I have the same ability to be prosecuted and extradited into America if those seeds came from there? Or from another country for that? <coughs> no, I, I think I could answer that. Yeah. Um, you, you would have to be uh, shipping uh, across the border for you to be open to that charge. And even then, in the case of Mark Emery, you not only have to be shipping millions over the border, but um, uh, spending a, a lot of money on political advocacy, you know, putting your face and name behind it, bragging about how you're, uh, you know, uh, undermining the DEA. Uh, it's very, very unfortunate what, what happened to Mark, that's for sure. But uh, it was the cross-border trafficking that opened him up to the uh, legal uh, what, persecution what, that he's dealing with. Yeah, you know, whatever you do individually up here in Canada does not 
subject you to America's laws. It's only if you do something across the border. And vice versa, from those states right. coming from the other parts of the world, would those people have the same circumstances to possibly be extradited into Canada to get charged? Um, in, in theory, the Canadian government could have charged Mark Emery or anybody else that's selling seeds right now in the country to Canadian citizens. It's a, a, a law that still stands on the books here. Um, it would be surprising for the Canadian government to go after people in another country and continue to ignore those working in this country. So if there's a clampdown on seed dealers, and goodness knows we've never worked out. On wood. Uh, if there was a clampdown on, on seed dealers, then uh, they would be, uh, you know, possibly open to that. But uh, um, you know, it's it's certainly something that uh, uh, you know hasn't been been looked into a little bit because uh, it, it doesn't appear as though the, the likelihood of being extradited from that country for seed sales is very great. Um, I don't know of many other places in the world where seeds are being sent to from. Uh, in, into this country at this point. Was, but, uh, you know, regarding seeds, a fascinating thing, there's a bill pending now in the state legislature to modify our medical marijuana law so that there could be dispensaries that could provide to people that, um, that have um, a permit or a prescription to get medical marijuana. But under the definition, they don't consider as marijuana um, seeds, stems, or leaves. You know, I guess it, the standards have gone up so high that I guess bud is what people use. You know, from back in the 1960s, we didn't know what bud was, you know. Leaves were what you smoked, and when things were tough, it was down to seeds and stems, as the phrase went. So um, I, I guess it's a new world. I haven't participated in the market for a long time. Um, I gather the quality's gone up and the price also. Okay, well, thank you so very much, John. Uh, Jim took a day off practicing law in Seattle to Thank come you here, very much. and uh, we're very grateful so for the time and energy you spent today, and just in general for getting out and helping to spread the message of LEAP. It's uh, very important. It's uh, wonderful to have uh, academics and officers and, and other people uh, speaking for the legalization of, of all drugs. And uh, it's one thing to be a, a user of, of something and, and wanting it to be legal, but to have uh, sober-minded and uh, very respected citizens speaking out, it's, it's critical to us. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we do have a member of LEAP in Victoria, David Bratzer, an active police officer, uh, but uh, unfortunately he is uh, an exhibits officer in our bakery trial, so we're keeping him uh, out of any hepology meetings uh, for the time being, uh, but our preliminary inquiry is expected in May, at which point uh, We'll be inviting him likely to come and speak next year and stuff. And uh, David Ratzer is an interesting story in and of himself because in Victoria we've been, you know, pushing with hempology and, and other people as well to legalize cannabis to be sure. And uh, a lot of members of the Victoria Police Force, uh, much like Seattle's, have gotten tired of busting us that are going to 420 or anything to that effect. And uh, to the point where uh, when David came public, it wasn't just his. Uh, you know, own opinion. David's actually the third youngest uh, police officer in his family. He's got two older brothers in the force. And the reason, or one of the main reasons that David felt comfortable and was able to go public with his position is because the Victoria Police Force, for the most part, supports change to drug policy. They realize that it's just not working. And uh, it's something where other officers will tell David, you know, good on you, I support you, I'm just not going to put my name behind it. But uh, David is uh, still uh, very active with, with LEAP and promoting the legalization of all drugs, and we're hoping more officers to come with it. But, uh, oh, you have one more thing, Jim? I see it now. I would be remiss, I forgot one thing. Our organization uh, loves to have people become members uh, to show your support for LEAP. We have sign-up sheets in the back. You don't have to give us money, uh, but like any organization, the more people that sign up to support our organization, uh, it helps us when we lobby and, uh, and push for change. So um, feel free to sign up. And also, again, our website has a wealth of information and links to other, other uh, websites that can provide information. Uh, but 
most people are pretty good on the web and, and uh, you'll know where to look for other stuff. But our, our website is leap.cc. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just to show it, if you all know, people even in law enforcement, at the back is Steve Finley with the shirt and tie as well. Uh, he's a, an economist helping out law enforcement against prohibition. And so there's lots of opportunities to get out and work and advocate with these different groups. And, and please do so.